And we are recording. Thank you guys so much for watching Flipcast. And today uh, I have a really special guest. Uh, as you guys know, if you guys have watched uh, anything on my uh, on my uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, when I talk about anime, Discotech is the one company that I keep saying is my favorite. Um, and this guy is behind a lot of those classic shows that I love. Um, so give it up for Justin. Justin, uh, if, for those of you who don't, for those of my viewers who don't know. Because most of my content is manga uh, centric. Um, okay. So for those of you who don't know, what exactly do you do at Discotech? Okay, so I'm in charge of uh, all Blu-ray production, and for about seventy to eighty percent of the titles, that bleeds into all aspects of production. Uh, so they send me whatever video materials there are. Sometimes it's a uh, uh, old master tape, like like this guy. <laughs> um, Sometimes it's a, uh, sometimes I'm literally ripping off uh, old DVDs and, and Blu-rays from other countries. Uh, sometimes they're giving me uh, USB hard drives like, like this guy over here and uh, with broadcast quality files on them. And I have to do whatever editing is required. I have to um, make sure the subtitles are, are done properly. I don't translate it myself because, or, or subtitle myself because I, that was actually going to so be much. one of my questions is how do you I used to you really? I, yeah. I used to, uh, back in uh, my central park media days. Wow. Just to completely date myself here. That's yeah. Uh, that yeah, is I, a name. I was doing all this. Uh, I mean, I, I, my, I got my start in high school as a VHS fan summer. So that's awesome. So actually, let's yeah. let's actually talk about that. How did you get into anime? Because I mean, I'm 28, so I'm, you know, I'm in that weird space where like older anime is something that I love, and I'm not okay. too big into newer anime. Uh, yeah. But I'm also like in that lost gap where like we don't really have like Cowboy Bebop. Maybe is that thing that my generation clings onto. But sure. what was anime like back when you were in high school? Uh, well, I. I first discovered anime, I was 13, and Blockbuster Video, remember yeah, them? Yeah. Uh, they just had like one little shelf of just stuff that had just come out. And there was not much out, uh, but they literally had one shelf uh, with about seven or eight shows. Uh, and that quickly grew into an entire like shelf shelf. Uh, and then it became two shelves. And I'm, I was like, oh, hello. <laughs> and I started, you know... <laughs> Now, now, mind you, um, because no one knew the stuff and nobody, ever, everyone was a little freaked out by it. Um, there was uh, this like little 17 plus sticker on all of it, no matter how uh, fine it was. You know, a lot of it had like a quick flash of boobs or something. <laughs> so uh, I always had to, you know, badger my parents like, no, no, it's fine. You know, it's fine. Just let me get it. Um, and sometimes. Oh, okay. Disappear there. There, okay. There, we're uh, yeah. still going. I, I think the internet dipped for a second. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so you would badger your parents? Uh, yeah, they... and I. They, it would it, for the most part the stuff they stocked at Blockbuster. It's, it's not like they had Roski Doji or something. Yeah. Um. So from that point, uh, I had to, you know, I would quickly exhaust the supply at Blockbuster, and I'd have to find the you know weird indie video store that had a bunch of like bad 70s exploitation films also and i'm and my parents be like i'm not sure i want you in here <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh i when i got to high school i found that there was uh there were some older kids who uh who were trying to start an anime club and at school and that didn't work because the principal of course wanted to see some examples of this anime stuff and and they, they were being him very fire. I ended up giving him Dominion Tank Police, which <laughs> at the ten minute mark has at the ten minute mark, if you've never seen it, there's some cat girls doing a strip tease. Yeah. Maybe not the best choice. So um we ended up with a uh, a fairly I think it was it might have been Detroit's first anime club. Um it was called Mana Anime, and then uh I met my uh, Justin, John I hate to do this. I think my yeah, headset just died out. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, take, wait. Take, do whatever you need. Um, let me, let me go get the, the USB C cord real quick. I'm so sorry. It's that fine. Is, no, no, I, no, it's fine. I had this charging all day, and then it just it must. I have wireless I headphones. And they suck, anyway, so I'll be right back. Best.
right. I am terribly sorry about that, bud. Not a problem. I, uh... I was rambling anyway, so <laughs> probably for the best. Um, so when you get into fan subbing VHS tapes, how yeah. the hell does because I can kind of understand how to fan sub like a DVD or a Blu-ray, but how hard was it to fan sub a VHS? It was a completely different world. Um, back then, um, Windows machines were just coming to the point where they were fast enough to draw the um, the subtitle and the outline and the drop shadow simultaneously. Uh, but prior to that, and the, still the most reliable way of doing it was with an old Amiga. Okay. Um, and uh, we used a program called Jayco Sub, which literally uh, we there was a device called a, a Genlock, which would pass the video signal through and layer the graphics on top of it. And like one, one color would be clear, like the background color would be clear. So it would just be, you know, a video overlay basically. And you would have to watch through the whole thing. And what we'd call Twitch time, which would be like, you know, hit space bar, hit space bar, yeah. space bar, return to clear the screen, space bar. And then you'd have to like go through the script like a few times just to manually tweak all the time codes just to, to fix it up. You would have to be really um, passionate about something to, to actually do that. You know, it was one of those things that I look back on. It's like, how the hell did I have that much time on my hands? <laughs> how old you were know? you? Was like this still thirteen? Uh, that, that was sixteen. That was 16? sixteen. Because at that point, the anime club I more merged into a different anime club, and uh, the guy that ran it, uh, John Pfeiffer, he he was um, a lot more tech savvy and had a real job, so you know he had he had money to throw at it so at what point did you go i might go to school for this i might make this my not like anime exactly but like video uh disc per uh, production well um it was a it was a weird bumpy road i had like my dad had a job in video production when i was younger uh like when i was six and i had i always always had a giant video nerd fetish um i ended up going i but when you grew up in Detroit, you don't really think of going anywhere. Or at least I didn't. Yeah. I, I I was dreaming very small. I mean, that's um, that's only five hours away from me. So I mean, I'm okay. Where, I'm, where are you? I'm in uh, near Champaign, Illinois. It's uh, oh, okay. Like you know, just yeah, Midwest uh, near. Uh, yeah, near Roger Ebert's alma mater. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. U of I. Uh, I mean, it's. But I, you know, I get what you're saying. I never thought of going anywhere. Just, yeah, just... it's like if you grew up in Detroit, you go you either go to Michigan or Michigan State. It's just what you do. Uh, and the cor of course, the year I, I graduated, Michigan won the Rose Bowl. And so all the smart kids went, hey, I'm going to apply there. And, of course, I got waitlisted. And then uh, so <laughs> I, ended, I ended up at Michigan State, which was not a good fit for me. I somehow fit in worse there than I did in high really? school. Really? Oh God, it was a disaster. Uh, I like because you know it's it's a bunch of like farm jocks there. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. yeah. And uh, that's I, how it is here. I, yeah, and I was a nerd, and I uh, it's just a really really bad fit. I lasted one semester, and so I was putting around, and I I had actually started Anime News Network at that point. Um, I started Anime News Network. Uh, wait, wait, are you I, are you the original founder of Anime News Network? Oh, you didn't know that? I did not know that. I I've been following you from Disco Tech. This is a huge surprise for me. <laughs> Holy shit! You're the original. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so you're so you're the original founder of of uh, Anime News Network. Yes. So yes. Uh... so when every so when I because you know Zach is now doing the show. Uh, right. Uh, when I listen to it and they talk about you, they have like this love for you, and I and I and I was like, man, they must really love the guy from. <laughs> Who does the disco tech production? I mean, this is kind of embarrassing, kind of unprofessional that I didn't do that well, much research. Well, you know, I used to host that co-host. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. But I, like but I, years. but I, but I never knew that you co-founded Anime News Network. No, I was the founder. You are the so you were the guy. Yeah. Uh, well, let, let me back up because that, that's, <laughs> that's giving myself a little too much credit. So I started the site in '98, uh, which was the year I graduated high school. Um, and I started it knowing that I'd be going to Michigan state and I'd be bored out of my mind. And I just, I would, uh, I needed something to do. And I was like, at, also at that time, there was just no good way of knowing what was coming, what was happening in the world. All we had to rely on was, uh, an America, which was Viz's magazine at the time. And not only did it have 
a month long lead time, but it was also very, very like clearly used by Viz as, as marketing. Yeah. So it's just like, come on, we, we need some. We, one time they ran a bad Ranma one half self insertion fan fiction as a cover story. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's just, and everyone's just like, okay, we need something. Come on. Um, and uh, so I went, it, I, and, you know, all we, the only other thing we had was Rec Arts Anime, you know, the news groups. And, you know, anyone could say anything there. And, you know, there was no way to verify it. It was just all rumor. And half the time it was wrong. So I started Anime News Network to try, try to act as some sort of central clearinghouse. Like, no, this is what's actually happening. We're going to actually talk to the companies, fact check, and actually... And now that website is happening. the most important website in this, this like, m- okay, media. Okay, so I did not do that. I did, <laughs> let me be very clear here. I did not do that part. Uh, I lasted for um, a year and a half. I did that while I took my, my break here after quitting Michigan State. Um, but I was 18, 19. I had no idea how to run a business. And frankly, it was... It was 90, 98, 99. Nobody knew how to run an internet business. But you really yeah. picked, so like you picked out the name anime news yes. network. Cause ANN sounds like name. a professional like thing. I mean, it's a, it's a very, prof- it's, it's a very professional thing now. And it's one of the yeah. only websites I actually donate to. Uh, Cause they, you know, you, they say the, like, like, like the whole ad revenue thing about once a I year, mean, I try to, I, I try to throw, you know, a couple bucks their way because that is a site that I use to keep up to date with stuff. And it's all because of you. I had no idea. That is nuts. Oh, fantastic! <laughs> you, know, the, you know, the uh, I don't. I I have no um, day to day involvement in the site anymore. I haven't in in many years. Uh, I was just writing Answer Man for the last six years, and that was yep. that was it. Now I just I stopped that. But those guys, people give in and a lot of shit, and people don't realize how hard that job is. So I like. Uh, I feel like the shit that they give them is a little like, it's a little. I think the shit that they so, give them is shitty. Like the stuff some like some of it is genuinely disingenuous. Like I don't want to even like go into like the whole Vic situation or anything like that, but like yeah, attacking yeah, nor, attacking nor attacking the people writing the articles is not it's not it's not it's definitely not a good look. Even if you don't agree with somebody, don't attack them on a personal level or anything like that. Um you know what I mean? And, yeah. I mean fans have always been shitty to some extent. I do think it's getting worse. I think um, so too. Actually, that is, uh, yeah. I mean, I was just talking the, to a friend last night about that. We we can come back to this, but we, uh, yeah. There, I I have had my moments in the last year where I've just been like, do I even still want to be a part of this? This like this is just so. This has turned into like the internet has turned everything into perpetual high school. Yep. Um and nerds talking about the thing that they're passionate about will never not be a giant cesspool of drama. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you should have seen the Flame Wars back back in the fan sub days. Holy shit. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I swear on this show? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes, good. you can. Excellent. <laughs> uh, um, but, you know, so it's always been a cesspool of drama. The This, like, relentless uh, harassment, however, that's new. And it bleeding into real life, that's new. And uh, it's something I'm very uncomfortable with and yeah I'm just like i quitting anime or quitting answer man honestly was partly about needing to take a step back from being so visible honestly uh for me just because it is just it was getting to be a lot i mean my channel is small i, I only have two i have 2100 and something subscribers but i've built that over seven months and uh you know i've done a lot that's, of po- that's pretty impressive for thank seven you months. thank you and uh i've done you know a lot of podcasts hours and hours and i've let slip some personal details and people have called my business people have you know found my personal facebook page and like like i mean these are people who are probably who like my content they just want to you know fuck with me and have a you know and like have a laugh but uh so now i've like purposely it's like just like you i've tried to pull back the private details of my of my life and uh, you are very, I mean, I've been following you on Twitter for a while. You are a very open person, like, for the most part. I don't I don't have anything to hide, really. Yeah. I mean, you know, I came out of the closet about seven years ago, and after that, it was just like, oh, what's left? Nothing. <laughs> 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 you know? Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, very early on, I discovered just how nuts the fans can, can really be. Like, 
early days of Anime News Network, even some of the fan sub days, I was getting some weirdos uh, knocking at my uh, knocking at my email box, and I'm I've had things far worse happen to colleagues. Um, and you know, you just have to, you just have to keep them feeling respected and make the boundaries very clear. Um, and I think that's really all you can do. And, you know, if someone doesn't want to abide by the, the laws of, of, uh, how, how social things work, it's, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Yeah. But let's, uh, let's, let's quit feeding into the trolls and talk about anime again. So when yeah, did please. you when did you go from all right so you worked on uh anime news network for a year and a half when did yeah, you about a year and a half so how long until you started doing this and when did well and was it always with discotech or did no, they reach no, out no. to you i um it, it's been a very long weird road here uh so i i moved to new york city uh after a year of putting around and I quickly realized that, and I, I ended up going to film school uh, at School of Visual Arts. And I that this was like a dream. And suddenly I was in a city where I wasn't a freak for liking, you know, cool foreign things. <laughs> uh, and I, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like, it, the, the, I was getting to do cool, nerdy things for school. Yeah. And, and uh, so I, I, Basically, Anime News Network wasn't making me beans, um, so I kind of lost interest in it, and some other people uh, decided to take it over, including eventually uh, its current owner, Chris McDonald, who is an awesome, awesome guy, and he's the one who built the site and knew what it is today. Well, congrats to him, man, because that yeah, is, seriously. It is a phenomenal site, and I mean, and I love, for the most part, I love everyone who writes on there. Like, Zach is fantastic. Uh, doesn't Mike Tool do some work on there, too? Yeah, Mike Tool. Uh, he's been a contributor. Um, he uh, he's editor at large, I think his title is. But yeah, he's been a contributor for many years. Uh, we're, one thing about like the inner circle at ANN is that everyone is is very. Uh, we all know each other extremely well. That's like, awesome. Most most of us are friends that go back decades. Um, it's it's just one of those things, uh, which isn't to say we always all get along. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Especially but, when you uh, have you know friendships that last decades, you're gonna yeah, you you're, know, you're gonna hate each other for a couple of years or you know a few months of that time period. Yeah, you know there's there's difficult periods, but you know there's always love there. There's always love. Um, at at any rate, uh, so I, uh, I I would you know New York City is also very expensive. Yeah, and uh, I was having to get a job, and I, I bounced around, and by sheer luck absolute dumb stupid luck i got seated next to a guy named john o'donnell on a plane back from detroit and john o'donnell was the president of central park media that's awesome and i knew who he was and after <laughs> talking to him and he was a really ch- he's he was a really chatty guy uh usually hyper caffeinated and <laughs> uh after some talking he realized he knew who i was wow were you like uh were you like kind of like fanboying a little bit like like oh my god this is i was able to hold my own and i'm very <laughs> proud of that that's awesome uh and so we talked a million miles an hour the entire plane ride back this is all of an hour and a half he hired me before we landed wow. um and uh i was their first in-house video editor and just to very, very much date myself, Final Cut Pro 1.0 had just come out. <laughs> How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'm 39. 39? Well, you definitely look like you're closer to my age. You look like you're Thank about you. 28, 29. Yellow don't, or uh, Asian don't race. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you're uh, you're a very fit guy, too. Yes, thank you. We're working on that. Um, so, I was 20. And I was a giant pest, but they realized uh, pretty quickly they they did need me there. Um, and uh, I was I was really, really annoying, but I was also one of the few fans that knew what they were talking about and could actually kind of function in a in a work environment. And so I started off making trailers and DVD extras for them. Uh, this was the era of like we have to throw as many things on a DVD as possible. Yeah. 
Um, and I wish and, that was still uh, kind of there because now a lot of releases come very bare bones. Except for yeah. Discotex has a lot except of for ours. yeah. Except for you guys, you guys go above and beyond on a lot of your stuff. To uh, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, you know, eventually. Uh, they at the time to make uh, DVD subtitles, they were outsourcing it for a ridiculous amount of money, and I uh, eventually realized that it's like this: these are just TIFF files. Uh, you can just there's have to be some software you can render these yourself. And I found one, and we eventually brought subtitling in house. And uh, the um, you know this was an era where things were changing from the old analog ways of doing video production to the more digital, you know, do it on a computer, on a, on a normal computer uh, way of doing things. And I, I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to help them bridge that, that transition. What was your very um, first release? Like your very first, like you could go to a store and buy release that you did the, for this. That I worked on. Yeah. Uh, saw Harlock Saga. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good show. So I'm, I'm proud of that. Now also, I, I was working on some of the most horrifying stomach churning hentai. <laughs> I actually just I just bought my first hentai recently. What is it? Uh Guy Double Target. Oh wow. Yeah, that that's pretty tame. Uh so I mean that's that's kind of why I don't like hentai. Uh I cuz I hit 2000 subs, I have to watch Bible Black. That was the joke. Everyone in the comments was like you have to watch Bible Black. So I'm gonna oh, watch boy. Bible Black, and uh, I watched some of the uh, the English subs on Twitter. Like I've seen some clips, and they they seem pretty funny. So I'm gonna watch All that right, with so my wife. <laughs> That's gonna a, be... <laughs> a week into my employ there, uh, I got to work on a trailer for this horrible, horrible hentai called. Uh, original title was uh, Maho Shoujo Meduru, uh Magical Girl Meduru. Uh We retitled it. Well, we retitled it Magic Woman M. <laughs> because a no one could pronounce Metadu and b uh it was probably supposed to be Merrill or something like that yeah um and b couldn't cower a color a girl because all all students in anime 18 releases are currently attending a two-year takugugaku or finishing school <laughs> you know that's some that of these uh, put on some of these pictures look uh they don't look very nice well okay so it was the one of the most disturbing things i'd ever seen the girl looks really like young. this that and being really viciously assaulted by a monster <laughs> in the most graphic way possible uh. like like uh, and the qc guys who, who had been watching everything were having trouble getting through it and uh I just I was sitting there watching this, like watching the because everything everything had to be captured off of tape in real time back in those days. I'm sitting there watching this. I'm just like, should I quit? <laughs> I don't. Uh, I toughed it out, and eventually I got to work on Project Echo. I got to work on Grave of the Fireflies. I got That's to work awesome. on all these classics. So you know, it, and then I got to work on you know Night Shift Nurses with the poop porn, and I was just like. Uh, <laughs> So you know, I shouldn't watch soul, Magical soul... Woman in with my wife. No, <laughs> no, you should not. It's uh, it's, uh, it's part it... of. I will be honest. Part of my soul died, and it will really? never come back. What? It's yeah, that bad. It, it was. Oh uh, man! Not, the the cumulative effect of three years of some of the most soul destroying shit that's ever been animated uh, was what did it. Because you know, it, at that time tentacled monsters were already passe so we were getting into like this hardcore really misogynistic torture porn we we're getting into like you know just it was just nasty stuff um and when i quit and i had my exit interview i told him it was like i can't handle this anymore like it's just too much uh although the real reason i quit was because central park media was slowly circling the drain they, they this was the era of ridiculous overspending by uh by the u.s publishers and a little mom and pop like central park media just couldn't keep up with it and ultimately no one could and the whole thing imploded a few years later so but, where'd you uh, go after CPM that was the first to go uh there was a startup uh called uh that that was focusing on asian pop culture uh that was a tv network called imagine asian tv <laughs> okay it's a very yeah, that, it's that, a very boring name yeah the um I was there for about three and a half years, and uh, 
that company was a mess. Um, they were trying to be a linear broadcast cable channel, a video on demand channel, a movie distributor, a home video distributor, a 24 seven internet radio network. <laughs> too and much. I think some up and manage two movie theaters. That's too much. That's too much work. Yeah, and they weren't really good at any of it, and they didn't have a good idea who their audience was, and they refused to spend money on content, but they would, you know, throw all this money at dumb shit like, hey, we have a billboard on the NASDAQ sign in Times Square at Christmas. Do you have coverage in New York yet? No. Wow. <laughs> so, um, that said, I was their only video engineer for all of that, and they were having me doing licensing. So, were you um, picking titles that you only like? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how that's how that's how we got to air like Twelve Kingdoms and Go Shogun oh, the wow. Time Tranje and like all this cool stuff. I got to license. We got to show Hikaru no Go. That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so I'm really like I I got to work on cool stuff and um. Did they like, at the same time? Did they like give you like a like a X amount that you could spend? Like, hey, you have this budget, uh, and you were like, I'm gonna yes, get Twelve Kingdoms. And it was, I, I had nothing to work with. Like, I had very little money to, to spend. But luckily, this was also the era because all the anime companies were getting really desperate at this point. So they wanted as much exposure for the home video releases as they could get. So I was able to get some of this stuff for next to nothing. Wow. Um, we, we did we did the branded block with Jenny on that we were able to get most a lot of their current titles for free, basically. Um, excuse me. Um, so... I um I got to work on everything. I got to try everything. I got to learn everything from broadcast master control to theatrical prints and and what you had to do to to make a 35 millimeter trailer uh, to you know you name it. I I I got to dip my dip my feet in it and, it, awesome. and learn it. And it was it, it was a great experience while at the same time being utterly dispiriting because the, the ship was rudderless the guys that ran it had no idea what they were doing um and i eventually bailed out and uh went back to anime news network for a time and anime news network was crunchyroll had not really fully launched yet they were still like kind of piracy site yeah they were um, going through that piracy phase which not which yeah. which uh which not a lot of people know but i think overall is yeah, really they, important for the history of the industry people... They've done a good job of making people forget about that. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Anime News Network, we were like, well, hey, we have this huge visitor base. Um, maybe we can turn, We maybe we can have a streaming site too. And so I did a lot of work. First of all, we tried to, we had, we did a, a newscast video, which was a lot of work and was, you know, the viewership wasn't there. Uh, this was pre-YouTube or you know, so I think we were a little bit ahead of our time there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, after we bailed on that, we we tried to get into the streaming business. We had licensed a ton of content from Funimation and Anime Animplex and and a bunch of other companies. And then we had an episode leak early, and it was one of the first times that it ever happened. And so it was a really really horrible day. And how did that uh, happen? Yeah. Did you guys ever find out how that happened? Oh, yeah, I know exactly how it happened. Uh, I had the episode on the server early, and so people were able to guess the file name. Wow. And you, and uh, I also didn't have it secured the way I thought I did. Um, so, yeah, it was, uh, it was a bad time. Um, did you guys get in pretty big trouble for that? I had to leave my best friend's wedding to... Uh, go to an emergency meeting where my where my boss and the Anaplex guys were from there to Japan to bow and scrape on our behalf. Wow. One of the worst days of my life. Was your friend pretty <laughs> understanding? Was he like, hey? Yeah, I mean, what, what could he do? I mean, I, I was like, I think my career is over. <laughs> Man, so uh, how so how so how old are you there? Like twenty two? Oh no! Well, Central Park Media was I, I was there for three and a half years. Uh, that was from age twenty to twenty three, twenty four ish. Uh, Imagination for another three and a half years. So I was around twenty seven there. So you're then, so you're around my age. This is like around this is around thirty. Oh wow! Around thirty. So this yeah. is a pretty scary time. Yeah. Uh, not my. Uh, 
around the same time, I, I was reputation as a video producer. Um, so I got asked by a few companies, among them uh, then fledging, uh, fledgling anime distributor and Samara uh, to help them out with some stuff. I, I had done some uh, also some freelance work for NY Post and uh, made a few Blu-rays for Bondi. Um, and there they wanted to get in first i had to help them because they didn't know what they were doing with with video uh their first releases didn't look so great and i had to go and help them show them how it was properly done uh they the people they had doing production really smart cool people but they had a print background they didn't have a video background um and so before i knew it uh i was doing blu-rays for them because everyone takes one look at the work that blu-ray is and is like nope nope not doing that bye <laughs> uh, blu-ray blu-ray is a, a whole is a beast man blu-ray is a beast is it so uh, is it then, is it still yeah. a beast even though now it's like the standard format or is it easier now oh yeah I, it, it never got easy even um, I have even when you're doing stuff that's like standard definition on blu-ray is that still just as oh that's harder that's, that's harder because oh yeah because okay so think think of it this way you have to encode the video separately you have to encode the audio separately you have to check and watch through everything. And then every subtitle is a graphics file with a time code in and a time code out. So it's one thing to have it on all that on a DVD where you have like, you know, two hours on one disc, maybe three. A standard def on Blu-ray can have like 20 hours of content. Wow. That's a lot. So you can imagine the stuff that can go wrong in 20 hours of content on one disc. So why um, so you and you, all the like all the stuff you have to juggle? You seem to be kind of pushing standard definition on Blu-ray, like a lot of your stuff has been lately yeah, has been standard, which I a, which I think is a great format. Um, I, I mean the Cyborg Zero Zero Nine turned out fantastic, considering the amount of shit that you had to go through to get that out. Like it looks amazing. Yeah, thank you. That <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I'm not personally. I'm not satisfied with that disc. At really, all, but I you know I. I work with what I got on that one. I mean, it. I mean, after hearing you on uh, Anime News Network talking about it and seeing those pictures on Twitter of what they gave you and just the nightmare, I was expecting a dumpster fire when I finally sat down to watch it. And when I and I watched it all in one sitting, uh, and I was like, "This is how it's fifty two episodes." Um, fifty one episodes. How my my wife. Uh, I was sick. I think I was sick, and my wife and our daughter went somewhere. And I stayed home, and I sat on the couch. I watched Cyborg, and I was playing Fire Emblem, the new Fire Emblem game. Um, so I was just, like, lounging and just – I never get a day where I can just vegetate all day. And that was the one day. And I remember being like, I thought this was supposed to look like uh, shit, but this looks great. Uh, well, I, the the whole second half of the show is mastered via analog cables, and it looks like garbage to my eyes. And I just – as a professional video nerd, it just kills me having to put out a disc that looks like that. But I'm happy that people are satisfied with how it looks. And they also understand the hell that I went through on that disc. I mean, I'm so, just happy you know, we have that show. It's never going to look better than that. It's never going to look better than that. I have that. That's me. I have to make myself be okay with that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Discotech I, is... Uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. There's like a delay on no, the no, stream. Uh, Discotech's yeah. now doing tokusatsu stuff. And is that a is that uh, a, yeah dip- is that a different process doing animation encoding versus live action encoding or? Uh no, I I make some tweaks, but generally generally the same settings that work well for anime work well for live action as well. Uh, mostly because it's about preserving film grain, and you know, anime just happens to be a lot simpler. Uh, and I'm really glad you guys are doing tokusatsu because and um. I, you know, I haven't checked in to see how well those are doing, uh, but I, I hope we can do more of them because there's a lot out there and uh, people seem to be really, really excited about like Just Beyond. And, oh, and, Just Beyond. Uh, I bought two, uh, I bought two copies of Just Beyond. So, yes. so, awesome. uh, just so cause, just cause like when that got announced, I was like, no fucking way they're putting out Just Beyond. And then the same, I think the same announcement message from space was coming out and I was like, are you, what the fuck is yep. going on at discotech? Well, uh, we're seeing how those do, and if, if we do well, we can get more. And, um, 
you know, there's uh, a big crossover between anime nerds and, and tokusatsu nerds. So yep. why why not see if it works? So uh, do you so do you like tokusatsu as well? Uh, I have a soft spot in my heart for it. I a, a lot of it is just I, a lot of it I can't take seriously to actually get through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is this just like uh, this like year in general. I mean, we're getting by next summer we're getting thirteen out of seventeen Ultraman shows on Blu-ray. Uh, that's incredible. That's that really I mean, and as a fan, I was like, and like I had a bunch of bootlegs of Ultraman, and I'm a man of my word. When those got announced, I threw all those away. And was like, we're getting legitimate copies of Ultraman. I'm so excited. And then Just Beyond as well. well. Just Beyond was such a fun watch. It's so, it's so over the top, and it starts like really strong, and then like the production values kind of get, you know, like the suits get less and less <laughs> intricate as time goes on. But that is a great show, and it's all in one disc too, which is I, just. I spent my entire time working on that show just being amazed at that the lead actor's athleticism. Oh, because <laughs> and that hair going crazy. He, well, yeah, I mean, that alone is very impressive, especially with Asian Asian hair. How do you do that? Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I'm I'm happy we, we were able to do that. Uh, I'm I actually produce about six discs a month for Disco Tech. Wow. Uh, and, um, you know, we have uh, Brady uh, Ashuro on Twitter who uh, produces a lot of the, like, the really, really higher end, the ridiculous stuff. Like, we're just, we're just wrapping up um, uh, Giant Robo right yeah, now. Yeah, finally. And, oh, God. Um, I just got the invoice back from our guy, Mark, who does all the, uh, all the QC. He has, he's the guy that has to watch through everything. He spent 65 hours just checking the disc. <sighs> wow. Uh, it, there is so much extra stuff on here, and a lot of it has been, you know, released in other forms before. Like there's these, um, you know, behind the scenes segments. Uh, there, there's randomly some Italian promo videos that we had to find an Italian translator. That is to get the, it subtitled. That is where my family's from, so that's actually kind of cool. It's just it's really there weird how like different countries have different like fandoms. Like I think Italy is really big yeah. in like Devil Man and uh, Cutie Honey. It seems like so. Like I remember being a kid, we would go to Sicily, and even before I knew what anime was, Devilman was like kind of big there, considering how religious that country is. It's I think that's why. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've experienced that too. I also do some work for. I've done some work for uh, Anime Limited, uh, all, aka All the Anime. They're a UK distributor, and what they're they're way more they can't price anything super high there but and they're way more into movies over there so stuff that sat on the market untouched uh nobody licensing them for like three or four years got snapped right up over there this this like past year for discotheque and for you has been huge you guys have been cranking out like you guys have been cranking out releases every month like what you guys have like an average like three releases a month yeah, it it depends on uh you know what's in what's been approved by Japan, what uh you know what what uh Selby the owner wants to release and what I have done. And you know, keep in mind I I can only do a finite number of discs a month, so if like one month we have a five disc set, well that's most of my bandwidth for that month. Wow. Um so like, you know, Kimigori Orange Road, that's the the T V series that's a five disc set. So I could really only do one other thing that month, uh, one other disc. Um, but they, then again, we'll throw, you know, 50 episodes on one standard def Blu-ray and that'll be one disc. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so how, <laughs> so, much. so how far in advance are you done with projects? Like, are you working on stuff right now? That's not even announced yet. That's just like way down the line. Uh, I am working on stuff that is not announced, but it will probably be announced in a, in another month or so. Basically we announced stuff when it's done and ready to go which is so cool you guys are like you guys are doing the nintendo direct approach almost where you guys just randomly on your guys's own time boom discotheque day here's five announcements here's release dates and it's just it's like candy yeah and occasionally we we will throw the fans a bone and like at our otakon panel we'll announce just a shit ton of titles but for the most part that's how we do it and the reason for this is delightful and basically there are two reasons first it really doesn't make any impact on piracy if you announce early uh so there's no point secondly uh 
we get really annoyed by people asking us for stuff that we've announced already and we're not ready to release. <laughs> so it's just like, all these people are asking us for this. Why did we announce this a year ago? Uh, but so, actually, yeah, that's, we, uh, you mean, I'm still waiting on uh, Go Armor, or Psycho Armor Go Varian. You guys announced that a while ago. And yeah, it's... hold on. Let me see when that's coming. Uh, <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. I have the schedule here. Give me just a second here. Go Varian. Oh, that's coming up. That's coming up pretty soon. So hopefully, uh, first or second quarter 2020. Wow. Awesome. Uh, I'm that really proud yeah. of that. That's that's coming up on my docket here. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, okay, so, luckily that's a that is blurry enough that people can't <laughs> need to go in and be yep. like, "What is yep, on I that?" Very careful about that. <laughs> very careful about that. Okay, so uh, so real talk, we Selby has licensed so much stuff that I am actually backlogged for about three years. Wow, at that current pace of six discs a month. Whoa, does that? Does that yeah. kind of make you overwhelmed or do you like that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, look, it's job security. I'm happy about that. Um, but at the same time, like, he, I mean, this office is a pigsty. I mean, I have tapes piled up everywhere, discs in the closet. I, I literally, I mean, look at this. I had to, I had to go to Daiso and buy a bunch of just cases to keep loose discs in. <laughs> these, these these are all Japanese imports wow. that I I have to like you know either rip some assets from or just kind of reference. What do you do and after those is, are I, done? I have two of these. I send them back. I don't want these. <laughs> I mean, could you keep and them? What, what am I what am I gonna what am I gonna do with them? I mean, you could keep them. You know, if like you're a collector, what? I mean, just to be like a collector. I mean, I have, I've I mean, bought way too it, much stuff. Well, there, there's no English on them. And if I did a good job, my disc should look just as good. Yeah. So I'll, I'll buy my disc if I want it. But, you know, why would why I keep the, the one with no English on it? I want the English. <laughs> so, my Japanese is adequate at best. You talked about piracy and it feels like yeah. Discotech's fan base is huge. You know, you, you, you guys got a great fan base. They're very passionate about what you guys They're are putting so in. loyal we have the coolest, coolest yeah. fans. uh i mean i have almost every release you guys have put out uh except for maybe five i just got i mean i, I talked to you on twitter before uh giant gorg you guys put that up yeah. on their ebay store and i was like yes i i uh i saved it i i got that thing on uh, ebay where you can like have it email you when stuff goes live and i got that email well, and look, i was like oh i gotta get that now because it's one of the only things i'm missing buy- don't buy everything. We have some garbage. Um. So here's <laughs> so here's my thing is that uh I'm I like to collect stuff, but I only collect everything from a couple companies. Like I collect uh, every disco. I try to collect every disco tech release. I have skipped out on a few things uh, because, yeah. like, like you said, I'm like ah, I'm never gonna watch that. But out of my thousand so anime DVDs and Blu-rays, I don't own like any like big shonen series like. I have most of it is discotheque um but like with manga i collect i try to collect um every like dark horse series because they usually kind of like lean towards my taste like gantz berserk blade of the immortal are yeah all, are all stuff that i love uh but discotheque seems like you guys are the nerdy version of the cry of the criterion collection you know i mean Criterion's pretty damn nerdy they are. I mean, yeah, they are. That's true. Uh, I was talking to Robert uh, Woodhead. I, I, I have here's my copy of Paris, Texas, right here. I mean, I, I got uh, I got Lady Snowblood and uh, Lone Wolf and Cub right here, just ready to uh, to snag up. Ro- Robert does amazing work too. Oh uh, man, Robert was so you. nice. Uh, I, I, I I I watched your whole interview with him. Oh, you did really? Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah, Thank that you. Good stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, Robert's incredible. And then afterwards, after we got off, we talked for like another forty five minutes. That dude is just. He's so knowledgeable, uh, so awesome. And then Megazone 23 is coming out. And I want to talk to you guys about Kickstarter, too. Uh, yeah. Do, have you guys ever thought about doing a Kickstarter? Because I feel like that would be... Well, you know, as Robert told you, Kickstarter is really best for marketing. Uh, it's really not a great tool for just getting something out. Uh, and it's so time-intensive and labor-intensive, especially fulfilling all the backer stuff. Uh, it's just not a good use of our time. We have so much to get through and so few people working on this. So I do every Blu-ray that Disco Tech puts out, every one of them. Uh, Selby, the owner, Selby, the owner of the company who also licenses stuff and has to, you know, 
do all the accounting and take care of fulfillment and also works the booth himself at most conventions. Wow. Uh, he, he does all the DVD authoring himself. Um, uh, Brady, you know, he has a day job um, at a games company and then also does this in his spare time and literally just does nothing but work. Uh, and, you know, he's the one doing like giant robo and Bobo Bo and uh, all the other sorry for a second. Oh. Um, there you go. Sorry, I lost you. Yeah, I was uh, low, low battery warning. I <laughs> might have to move the camera in a second. Um, and uh, so, you know, we're we're stretched very thin. We just don't have the bandwidth to handle something like Kickstarter. Well, I mean, it feels very grass. It feels very grassroots what like you guys are doing. It's, it's very niche, like very small team. You guys are putting out very niche titles. Like, I mean, Giant Robo yeah. and Cyborg are very loved, but when you look at anime, those like, People don't talk about that now. Like you go to Reddit, no. it's always the top like seasonal stuff, and that's why that's why you I know. love Discotech is that also from a history point of view, these titles would be lost to time or you know eventually just go to the wayside. But you guys are well, keeping them alive. Every and we're really happy that people recognize that because you know these aren't the titles that are going to be moving you know twenty thirty thousand units for the most part. Uh, you know maybe something like like uh, Castle Caliostra will do that. But, um, you know, most of these are lucky to sell a thousand copies. Oh, wow. Um, I, I didn't know that. Oh, really? yeah. Uh, we have to keep costs bone thin if, if we're going to uh, make any sort of profit on these at all. So, uh, wow. And, know, that, and, and that makes it even more special and, when you hear, like, when you guys see how much love you put into each disc. Well, yeah. And, you know, I, um, it, we want to make because so few people are buying it, we know the people that are buying it are the people that really, really care about it. Uh, and so we want to make our release the last time they'll ever have to buy it. You know, this should be, you know, this, this disc should be the, uh, you know, your, your grandfather's copy of, uh, <laughs> of Tolstoy that you that you got handed down to you. Yeah. And you also know, that, like, that's, I mean, you, you guys like, I mean, just like I said, like the whole time thing, uh, has there ever been a license that you guys have gotten that you've been like, holy shit, like we've, we got Lupin or we Many. got, like, what's like, like, what's been your favorite project to work on in the last year or so? Uh, well, definitely Robot Carnival. Really? Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, that disc, I believe it to be the most complex uh, non-studio Blu-ray, uh, non-major studio Blu-ray uh, ever made. And it actually got highlighted by Cineris, the company that makes like the big expensive authoring software as like a title that they showed off at, at NAB, the big video nerd expo last and year. That was all you. That was uh, me and Brady. Well, that was a team effort. Wow. Um, but that disc actually um, reassembles itself on the fly in three different configurations with different titles, uh, depending on the version that you're watching. Wow. How'd you guys uh, do and, that? You know, uh, some really dirty Blu-ray tricks. Uh, <laughs> basically, we had we had to split the disc into like thirty-seven, or we had to split the movie into seven thirty-seven different pieces, and from those pieces, we just build different playlists. Uh, and with some connections being seamless, uh, you couldn't make all the connections seamless, or the disc wouldn't work. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we uh we had to really annoy the center tech support guy a lot on that project. <laughs> Hey, how do you but, do this? Uh, help us, help us. Uh, or why isn't why isn't this working? I'm getting this weird error I've never seen before. <laughs> uh, actually, we just finished our first uh, UHD 4K. Yeah, Blu-ray. that's that that was one of my questions. Uh, first off, congratulations, the first US 4K release for an anime, which is uh, I will go to my grave with that one. I uh, I actually got mine pre-ordered. I got that. Was it that? Uh, what else got announced? on that on that block uh that actually okay so that actually broke the uhd blu-ray version of cinerist uh, really they had to make a special new build just for us because Holy they could shit. we couldn't yeah like i don't know what it was i think it was some weird combination of the way we made subtitles with the way we encoded the video that should have worked and was fully up to spec but didn't and they had to modify the software for us and release the new version because we broke it. Well, that's a pretty cool company to like work with you guys that fast and that. Oh, Cin- I mean, those guys are excellent. Actually, um, so Cinerist is ludicrously expensive. Uh, one 
copy of just the regular Blu-ray software is thirty-seven thousand dollars SRP. Holy shit! Yeah, that's why I'm not too worried about competition. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty-seven thousand. Let me be clear. I got it through an upgrade, so I didn't pay that. Uh, but uh, Cinerus, those guys are awesome, and they recognize when someone is really, really pushing their software to its limits, and they kind of noticed. Senpai noticed us. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But that's a lot of money, though. Um. Yeah, it is. Uh, all told, on Blu-ray software, I don't think I've made it to thirty-seven grand, but I've probably spent at least twenty. Um, wow. And you years. and you it, and you had to upgrade stuff recently to even put out the 4K disc, right? Oh well, yeah. Okay. So um, the 4K is tough already, but uh, 4K HDR is a beast because a bunch of different software like Premiere and Final Cut says they can do it. They can't. Lies. Uh, in order to do anything with the video and have it still look like it should at the end i had to get the paid version of davinci resolve uh and to do 4k i had to upgrade my video card and oh, i'm losing the light here um i had to upgrade my video card to a uh, are you a gamer oh yeah yep. oh. yeah yeah I, I had to buy an rtx 2070 uh, so that, that's that's a good chunk of change that that wasn't cheap and like i maybe could have saved some money buying from newegg or something but i had to run out in the middle of the night because i'm just like <laughs> i can't do this uh, so um and then i had to buy this buy this new uh you know uhd tv just to see what i was doing and then i had to you know like all this added up and but can't you all write that off for taxes at the end of the year though that doesn't make it free (laughs) (laughs) whatever just means you pay less taxes at the end of the year that's not a deal when i uh like like uh like for uh like for instance our pizza oven just broke we have one oven in the restaurant and uh it was either buy a $37,000 oven or, I mean, because like literally ovens are that expensive because ours is gas powered. Uh, but the yeah. company, because it's from the it's like 1980 or something, this oven's old. Uh, they purpose, they had to make parts specifically for us and we ended up spending six grand on just upgrading our yeah. oven. It's just, it's, it's insane. You know, when you're, when you're doing something so esoteric that only a few uh, companies in, uh, around the around the world even deal with, uh, you know, you you just, everything is expensive and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't i'm lucky that cinerus does the last uh blu-ray software i was using do studio that was a hot mess half the features didn't even work wow and uh, how, and... in fact you can you can draw a very clean line in the sand what discs were made with cinerus and what were made with do studio because the cinerus ones have like navigable art galleries that work and have uh subtitles that don't blink when they refresh um and all the do studio ones they're they're held together with duct tape and prayer and does that software cost a lot of money as well or is that just like uh do studio was the cheaper professional blu-ray option uh that used to be released by sony uh and it got discontinued oh wow so they're just gone so yeah they're gone and uh honestly good riddance but and cinerist was generous enough to provide a uh, a very reasonably priced upgrade path and by reasonably priced, I mean like seven grand. <laughs> That's better than thirty-seven grand. Yes, yes, it is. And so I, re- I like, I'll take it. So yeah. who pays for that? Does the company pay for that, or Me. so that comes out of your pocket? So I'm my own company. Uh, my company is called Media OCD. Yep, which I um, which I see on we, Twitter. Yeah, my uh, my slogan is "We have issues, our video doesn't." <laughs> um, That's a pretty good slogan. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we're um, I. Not only do I do stuff for Discotech, but I also uh, do stuff for uh, TMS, the producers of Lupin. Uh, they have an office here in L.A. Um, that I, I work with quite a bit. Uh, I've been starting to do some stuff for um, for uh, Sunrise. Uh, Which is and awesome. I've done stuff. Congrats. Yeah, th- thank you. And um, Is that I've stuff that's coming stuff. out here in the States? Uh, the I'm the guy who uploaded Gundam NT to Amazon. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, and there's like, a bunch there's, of other Gundam stuff too. There's a couple Sunrise stuff like um, uh, Panzer World Galliant that I would just fucking kill to have over here officially. Yeah, that'd be nice. That would yeah. be incredible. Um, Make that I'm happen, just, I'm Justin. Just excited. <laughs> I'm just excited about City Hunter. Yeah, yeah oh man, that. when you guys announced that, I was like, holy shit. 
I'll I will not lie. The first time I sat down and got to watch the new the new movie that is coming out in a few months, um, I they the movie starts with my favorite uh, City Hunter song, Angel Voice. Okay, yeah. Uh, the second opening, the second series opening, and I, I like I got misty. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> can I uh, can I ask you like a little bit of uh, like sure. not personal, but like. For instance, Sentai Filmworks licensed a bunch of Sunrise stuff. Like a like yeah. like and half of those titles are not out. Someone apparently asked them at uh That was oh, like 7 years ago. Yeah, which is which is which is weird cuz some of those titles I want uh like well, uh, Skyrim. 7 years is 7 years is the length of a contract. Really? Is that the average length of a contract? Sometimes it's five, sometimes it's seven. On rare occasion, it's ten, but it's usually five or seven. So someone at Hodokan asked them, hey, what's the holdup on these? And they said they basically alluded to it being Sunrise's fault. Have you guys seen any pushback or pull from Sunrise when it comes to, you know, like, for instance, City Hunter? Because like, that's a pretty big title. You know, that's like their um, version of Lupin almost. Well, you're you're asking about uh, private communications between companies. Oh so yeah, I can't so give that, you, that's I will, yeah. Good or bad, I'll never be able to give you a straight answer to yeah. that. Uh, but uh, I will say that uh, Sunrise has been uh, has done everything they can for us with uh, with City Hunter, and I think everyone wants to make it a success. That's awesome, and I'm really glad you guys are doing City Hunter. That's that is a huge get. I I am too. I'm uh, chafing at the bit to get that out the door. <laughs> so, uh, what's been your favorite project this year? And not like project like I'm finally glad Cyborg is done, like something that like we, that like that you got to something work on. That actually made my heart sing. Yeah. to actually be a part of. Uh, probably Kimmergarten Orange Road. Awesome. Um, that's one of those that like I didn't have a ton of love for it when back in the VHS era. Like I, I liked it, but I mostly liked it for the first ending theme, and I didn't really connect with it all super hard. Um, but. Uh, this time going through it with like more adult eyes, I'm seeing it for just how amazing it is. Like it is so well written. It is so smart. That's uh, awesome. The characters are so well realized and fleshed out. So yeah, I'm. Um, and you guys also just put I'm out really the o, the OVAs as well, right? Or is that yeah the OVAs out? and no those are out. Those are um, out. the the first uh, and the first movie we do not have the rights to the second movie because it's a different producer. That sucks. But you guys have like and what, that, like ninety percent of Kimigori Orange Orange. Well, that, that, and that second that second movie is more of a reunion special than a than a proper sequel. So it's like, eh. it's like whatever <laughs> you you like the fans yeah. got ninety percent of it. The w- of, would we love to have it? Yes, license. I don't. I I'm not holding my breath for us to get it. Uh, it would be great if we did at some point. Uh, but I don't think the owner has the owner of that movie has remastered it anyway. So. So you, so you guys would have to do that work if you guys ever. Uh, well, it, you can't just go in and remaster something because you need access to the film. Oh yeah. And they're, you know, they won't just give that to you. In fact, they might not even know where it is. Re- that's what uh, that's what Robert said is that half the time when you go into licensing, one company will say the other company has it, and then that company says the other one has it, and then you're just like, which one of you sure. has? Which one of you has this damn license? Well, yeah, I mean there are. Uh, we just tried to license a show uh, from my from my past that shall remain nameless, and we went to the licensor, and that licensor now makes uh, industrial videos. They're not an anime producer in any way anymore, and they're just like, yeah, we don't know. We think Bandai Visual has that, and we're just like, Bandai Visual? They're not on the, the credits at all, but okay. Hey, Bandai Visual, you have this? And they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> So you guys just gave up. You're like, whatever, just move on. Well, what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing to do after that. Where do you do? You can't convince someone they own the rights to something because, you know, they have to go through all their production contracts to make sure that they have the rights to sell or that they cleared it for online streaming or for Blu-ray or whatever. You know, a lot of those old, um, those old contracts were not made with current formats in mind and have to be to some extent renegotiated. And most of the, forward-looking companies in japan have gone through their catalog and cleared all of that and it was a lot of work for them but companies that aren't in that business anymore they haven't done any of that so a lot of that stuff is not possible to license anymore it's just gone i have a couple questions from uh from some uh sub uh from some subscribers 
because uh, sure. I... Uh, before we get to that, let me move this so I can okay. plug in my phone because my battery is dying here. Because this was nice this was uh, this was this was a huge uh, pleasure for me, man. Like you're absolutely one of the kindest people I've talked to. Uh, Discotech is putting out some of my favorite stuff. So oh, this this was fun. You're uh, you're uh, one of one of the. Uh one of the cooler interviews i've done so. oh wow That's... awesome thank you <laughs> uh, uh you you wouldn't you wouldn't believe how badly somebody's gonna believe me <laughs> oh i uh i tried to do as much research as i possibly could uh with my work schedule i work about 80 hours in five days uh because i am a because you know we're a small family it's kind of like discotheque we're a small family you know business which is that's a really good angle by the way uh i yeah. like i i love the uh Okay. I love the is it off? shots. It feels like it's off. It's it might be off a little bit, but most of the people who are gonna watch this are gonna like put it in their pockets and listen to it. Right. Okay. Um, but uh, there we go. So a couple people want to ask: um, How often does Discotech actually listen to the fans? Uh, well, we're always listening, um, whether we choose to pay attention or not. Is a story. <laughs> uh, I you think know, the, the I think is, I think more of what he's asking is like how often does do fans request a title, and how often does that constantly. usually usually actually plan out? Zero. <laughs> um, okay, so if you go on the Discotech Facebook page, and every time we announce anything, I see it in the comments. All of the comments are just all people barking titles at us. Yeah, and. You know, it's like, we know what's out there, guys. We know. Uh, and, you know, half the stuff you're asking for, we don't even know who owns it. <laughs> and, and holy shit, did you really ask for a World Masterpiece Theater show? We would we would sell 30 copies of that if we're lucky. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, it, uh, we're always talking, and if a particular show tends to come up a lot, we'll be, we'll, uh, we'll be like... Uh, Actually, a, a surprising amount of input comes from Selby working the booth at conventions because everyone thinks that they're just a retailer because it's such a nondescript booth. It looks like a garage sale almost. Um, so people are coming up to him asking for titles, not knowing that they're the company that is actually licensing and producing. Them. That's cool. So he's got his uh, ear to the ground. Exactly. That's how he figures out what there's actually demand for because, you know, the the, the anime world is just rife with history of like fans getting online getting all worked up about certain titles and then company licenses them company releases them and then no one shows up yeah i i mean yep i mean kind of like i mean to relate it to food is that like you know like we people will be like do you have the sandwich we'll create that sandwich and it doesn't sell well and then we just lose money because food rots you got to throw it away. So then we get rid of it and people are like, yep. what the fuck? That was my favorite sandwich. Like, well, why weren't you in here more eating it? Exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. And, you know, it, I, other publishers have been burned time and time again. And we've, it's not like we always pick winners, but at least the losers are cheap usually. You guys, like, there's not a lot of companies like Discotech still out there like back in the day you know you had a no. there's a lot of companies but now you got you know sentai puts out their stuff uh and anaplex puts out outrageously expensive box sets uh right and i buy them because i want gurren lagan and i want kill a kill and uh sure but then there's not a lot of companies like discotech so like and when you said we're lucky if a disc sells a thousand copies how do you guys with all the stuff you're licensing with all the different stuff you guys have still out there how is that like business model still like viable? Like, do you guys and also you guys have been going into like streaming services now too? Well, that's another source of revenue for us. So you know, the, sometimes a show won't be viable unless you know a friend of ours like Crunchyroll comes in. And it's like, hey, we'll help you pay for that if we can get streaming. And we're like, okay, sure, that's awesome. Uh, or actually, actually, that's how a lot of dubs have come up. Is uh, you know, they uh, Crunchyroll uh, worked with us to uh, to do Kimono Friends. And uh, the reception of that dub, we actually dubbed that uh, ourselves with a company uh, in Texas called Sound Cadence, who they're a little new upstart uh, dub studio, but they did a fantastic job. And I've spent the last week going through Japanese uh, otaku Twitter, watching Japanese fans react to the English dub. And are they pretty hyped on it or are they? 
They love it. It's That's awesome. Weird. I've never seen Japanese fans this involved in how a Jap how an English dub sounds, but they they're really into it. Who's uh, uh this, so. this is an off topic question, but who's more toxic, yeah. Japanese fans or English fans? I don't my my uh, experience has so predominantly been with English fans. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. Okay. Um, that said, uh, I think everyone has uh, is capable of great evil, yeah. or, or <laughs> and, and likewise they're capable of great good. And you know, uh, some some people they they just catch a they just catch in a jet stream that sends them in a really bad direction and they gotta you gotta you gotta watch yourself did uh did you work on those beyblade blu-rays yes so in this year you've done beyblade just beyond yep cyborg yep. and you're getting ready to yep. do giant robo like that's just such an eclectic taste of oh no giant and... robo's done uh we're just i'm just, we're, i'm just waiting on the fixes uh boba bo is getting checked right now oh, which God. that's insane <laughs> that you guys even are putting that that's like that's right up there with uh chargeman ken that like that's just i mean i just that when i got those tapes i think in january of 2018 and it's just taken this long uh you can imagine the subtitles on that what, the, oh. what that was like uh we uh, yeah we'll we'll get into that another another time but it's uh we we should have that out pretty quickly um it's supposed to be december the, right home stretch on that uh, we're not going to make December, probably January. Um, well, that's perfect. That's my birthday month. I'm going to be watching Bubba Bo with my wife there on my birthday, and she'll be like, what the fuck is this? It's actually really funny because my wife is from a very small town here. Uh, like, her graduating class is like 30 people. So, Oh, wow. So she's – and she's also quite younger than me. She's 22. Uh, so okay. when when we met, which we met at the gym, actually. She was working the gym, and I was watching anime on my phone, and I remember wa her walking by, and I was like, that girl is really beautiful. And then I approached her. And I was too nervous to uh, talk to her because I was still that 340 pound kid in my head. And uh, mm -hmm. actually, she made the first move. She was like, "Hey." But uh, so when I when like we were going on dates and we we're getting to know each other, she was like, "What do you do?" And I'm like, "Well, I like um, I like anime and I read a lot of manga." And she was like, "Anime." Like her brain instantly went to hentai. But lately, I've been showing her stuff and we've been watching stuff. And uh, I think the next thing we're gonna watch is gonna be. Com Moto friends. I think that's going to be the show. And it seems friendly enough that our like 18 month old can like, it. like watch and have fun. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I accidentally, that, that I, good for the whole family. I accidentally watched Akira with my daughter, uh, like when she was 16 months and after it was over, I was like, I like looked at her and she was just like fixated. We don't let her watch a lot of TV. We try to keep screen time down to a minimum, especially since, you know, that seems to be a problem with kids these days. So we try to keep her as yeah. active as possible. Like my wife takes her to the Y and, uh, you know, especially since I have like weight problems on my side, we try to keep her sure. active. Um, but she watched Akira the whole thing and just sat there and was just fixated on it. And after it was over, I, I looked at her and I was like, you know, I probably shouldn't have watched Akira with a 16 month old. That's that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> it was one of the bad I parenting mean... moments. While I tend to agree superficially, <laughs> looking back in my own past, so the first movie I remember seeing as a kid was Flashdance. That's a which, that, that's an odd choice. Well, the reason it was because I was three, and I was my parents went to a drive-in, which was a thing back then because old. And hey, they, we still we uh, still have drive-ins around me. Wow. Yeah. Uh, well, they, it was a double feature, and I slept through the first one, and they're like, "Thank God he's going to sleep through the second one." Wide awake for the second. <laughs> one. How old were you again? Like eight? Three. Oh three. wow! Wow. Three. Um, and I was obsessed. Mind you, this is an R-rated movie. The that's Flash a, Dance is about strippers. That's it's an R-rated movie. Uh. I have, I still have the soundtrack on vinyl, original issue vinyl with like the sparkly Justin sticker. I was obsessed with this movie, um, and now I'm gay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what you're saying is my daughter's gonna grow up and be obsessed with the Akira soundtrack. I well, you could have done a lot worse. Is what Which I'm honestly, that's a really good soundtrack too. E either she's gonna be obsessed with the Akira soundtrack or. Um, 
large inflating building high skyscrapers of exploding rupturing flesh <laughs> well either one's fine with me <laughs> okay uh so either way she sounds pretty cool <laughs> she is she is actually really cool uh we uh every august we take two weeks off work and by off work i mean we don't have to deal with the public which is a vacation we we tear all the equipment apart get everything fixed so she saw me almost every day for two weeks straight and then now this transition back into me going to work she's been have crying it's been breaking my heart because i i just uh, i just i love being a I, you know it's one of those things where like i know ne- i was not ready i remember playing when my wife found out we were pregnant i was playing persona 5 and she put the she put the test down and i just stared at the wall and i was like well there goes my dreams of going to japan next year there goes all these things but now i it's the best it's the best feeling and i don't know i just i like love i love loving my you know my family members i have a very close-knit family because you know we're loud boisterous italian people so yeah uh but that's so nice though that's so it, nice. yeah it's nice and i mean luckily i grew up with parents uh who because my because my my grandparents are from sicily so which is like the island right off of italy yeah and a lot of our family members are a little darker so when they moved in 1969 to the midwest uh and opened up a restaurant they were met with a lot of racism so mm. I, I was lucky enough to be raised by two parents who taught me, you know, never judge anyone based on any credence, like at all, like any, anything that they can't control, do not judge them based on that. So, um, yeah, which is pretty unique for a Midwest, especially because it's like Illinois is almost the deep South when it comes to. Yeah. I mean, Michigan ain't much better. I mean, Michigan, D- Detroit is ludicrously segregated. Um, is it still? You know, there, there are whites. Oh, there are white suburbs. I don't know about now, but when I was growing up, there's there there were white suburbs, black suburbs, and there the two shall meet. Um, but you know, my my mom, you know, both my parents are from the area. My mom's Chinese American, and she grew up during the Detroit race riots. And you can imagine what it was like <laughs> to be China, a Chinese American girl in the Detroit race riots. That would be scary. Uh, was, that would be really scary. Yeah, yeah, it was not great. Um, so you know, there there is. I think there's a lot of shared experiences there, and uh, I hope a lot of people from you know younger generations like ours, more yours than mine. Uh, <laughs> You're still, you are still young. You are still. Thank still you. Young. I, I try to stay ludicrously immature. Um, it's me too. Yeah, uh, but you know that I, I, I wish I, I wish I had that to be honest. My my family, you know, I love my my family dearly, but they're all they all live in another state. I'm the only one in California. Um, and, but at uh, least you're in California, you know. <laughs> I ain't mad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's just it's so weird. Like I didn't know what racism was until I was probably a teenager because I didn't like my parents weren't racist or bigoted towards anybody. Uh, but I remember when I remember when Ob- I remember when Obama got elected the first time. I was a senior. I was a junior senior, and someone came into our restaurant and called him you know, the, you know, the N word. And I remember being like, being like, whoa, like, I thought that was just dead. I thought that word, I thought that, that kind of hate was just gone. But now that I'm older and I see it all the time, it's breaks my heart. But like you said, people last last couple of years has been pretty hard to ignore. (laughs) Oh man, this, I don't even want to talk about this. Cause uh, like, for instance, my, like, I mean, just to touch on it, for instance, my aunt who is bit, she's 52 uh she speaks english she was born in sicily uh she almost got she has two kids she's married she's owns a business here taxpayer she almost got deported because of trump like almost almost got sent back like her wife i mean her life would have been just uprooted and just ruined because so i mean so yeah like immigration is a very personal thing i'm very pro immigration because of my family and that's there's very, something very close y- you to know heart. Bizarrely, a lot of people I've met that are the most anti-immigration are the ones who are immigrants themselves. That yeah, that kind of it, it's like they they're here and they have to like prove how American they are by shutting the door behind them. Uh, I had this great incident with uh, my Chinese grandmother. My Chinese grandmother, she's ninety something and she is a battle axe of a woman. That's like, awesome. Sometimes, uh, <laughs> but okay, so. I, I never came out to her because there's no point. Uh, and uh, did you ever watch The Sopranos? 
Oh, of, of not course. Story, but... Of course. Yeah, uh, like, I mean, there's characters okay. based off of my family members. Have you heard of the? Have you heard okay. of the? Have you heard of the Pizza Connection? Right. That. That's that's actually uh, that's... that's actually my great uncles. <laughs> Oh, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. It's so, but like, okay. but like, but like my grandfather did not want that life for his family and came here. So, so, you know, you know, Tony Soprano's yeah. uh, mother. Oh yeah. That's my, that's my Chinese grandmother, <laughs> except with a shrill Chinese accent. Oh man. Just the most sour. So, uh, one time I was, I was there for Christmas and, uh, she goes, death in. I'm like, yes. And she goes, when you when you uh when you go with with girl, don't go with smart girl because smart girl wants smart guy. <laughs> just apropos of nothing, and I'm just like, I'm smart, and she goes, depends. <laughs> but seriously, she told me last time I called her, she was like, Justin, all all immigrant bad. <laughs> You're like grandmother. You are a immigrant. I didn't even. I didn't even bother. I'm just like, what do you? What do you even say to that? My, uh, what, 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 what difference are you gonna make there? My, uh, actually, my, uh, my grandmother has a very broken English accent too. Uh, and when I was super fat, she was like, "Flipo, you so fat." And I'm like, "Thank you, Nona. That is a very nice thing for you to say <laughs> to somebody struggling with weight. Thank you so much." Uh, but they I love you too. I'm like, I love you too, uh, dude. Grandparents are the best, but it's also sad because mine are getting at that age where their brains are going. And yeah, it, I I lost uh, I lost most of mine. I'm down to one. But uh, the the um, I feel my mother is like starting to head down the road of of like no filter old person. <laughs> <laughs> so so now. Uh, like I was talking to her and she's like, you know, you walk differently now. Maybe it's because you're gay. I'm just Whoa. like, okay, first of all, I didn't just become gay. Second of all, what? <laughs> That's a very weird thing to correlate the two. And and I came to the conclusion that's because I actually have legs now because I work out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so like I have I don't have the thigh gap. I got the legs rubbing against each other. Like and she's like, okay, that must be it. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's probably it. Uh, when I got when I was at my buffest, I was walking, and my dad would be like, he's like, what are you showing off? Are you peacocking? He's like, you're still a pussy, dad. I'm like, I'm a, or like, like like he would call me a pussy, and I'm like, dad. Jesus. I'm like, dad. My dad has no filter, but he's well, also one of the nicest, most loving guys I've ever met. Um, he's, yeah. I mean, he's, my dad's getting strangely woke, which is hilarious. I've, t I've told the story before, but my dad, you That's know. That's great. I wish my parents would. He, like, like, my dad's almost 60. He's, uh, he grew up on a farm. He moved to Colorado when he turned 18. So, like, he's had this very sheltered life. And, like, I don't know if it's because he's listening to podcasts now or if he's just watching, like, documentaries. But I'll just show up for work and he'd be like, hey. Uh, Flippo, um, the cops are killing a lot of African Americans, and I'm like, well, first off, you said African Americans, you, you're not saying black people, you're not, you know, like I'm like, okay, that's actually a good observation, Dad. Or then one day he was, one week he's on this kick of, man, we really screwed over all the uh, N Native Americans, and I'm like, yes, we did, yes, we did, Dad. And he's just like, that's just unfair, it's so disgusting. And I'm like, where what is, is this happening? I'm like, what is happening? My dad is woke and, uh, and I, and I love it. I think he's, it's just so funny. Cause he's like, he's trying to like, he, now we only serve organic, you know, stuff. Like we, he gets the organic cream. He, you know, he's, he's into farm fresh eggs and farm grass fed beef. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dad? Like, well, which, which is great. Like really good business. First of all. Which is, you know, which is also, and then like now we have cauliflower crust for gluten free people. We have a gluten, we have one gluten free pasta because it's a pain in the ass to make. But it's just like yeah. the last five years, my dad has just become so woke, which is awesome. But he still blames everything on my generation. He's like, you millennials. And I'm like, shut up, boomer. And uh, we just, I mean, I was going to say, boomer has become a generic catch all. Which, for, yeah. uh... <laughs> shitty old person so <laughs> which <laughs> like which you know like which my dad is not a shitty old person he's just he's just joking around and uh yeah it's just it's so we, weird it's so weird how we had woke to have some interventions with my dad and fox news a few times so <laughs> my dad but, hates fox news which is actually well we which is we, good we got him to, we got them to cut cable so that that that's that that's been a thing now so we're i think we're we're past that finally 
He's yeah. he's not getting the steady stream of of uh, of hate. So which which is good. Now my dad listens to like he listens to like the Joe Rogan podcast, which can still be a little uh, dicey and a little controversial, yeah. but it's better than just watching Fox News. So I'll take that any day of the week over Rush Limbaugh or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, also my dad, he doesn't like rap, but he loves uh, Killer Mike. He's like, I love the way Killer Mike speaks. I'm like, what is wrong with you? Like, where are you? Where is this coming from? Was he, was he in a car accident? You were on? no, no. I just, I just think, uh, I just think he was, you know, had a shelter, not like a sh- super sheltered life because you know he was a wild man back in the day. But like, like he lived in a very small town with no people of color or, or any race except for my. They met my. He met my mom. They were the only out of you know out of the country people in the town. So he was super like closed like they're just closed off to all the hate in the world and then now that he's older he's just like this shit is fucked up and i'm like yeah yeah i'm like yes dad and then now right now he's like privatized prison systems are terrible and i'm like <laughs> like yes that's you know his lips to god's ears i mean <laughs> <laughs> it's just so strange and but he still makes fun of me for anime or uh, I'm, a, I'm i'm a big power rangers fan uh so when i'm like closing up it's my turn to like to turn on the TV because he goes home because he's old. I'll be like, good night, old man. He's like, you gonna yeah. watch your Power Rangers? Or uh, I put on Dinosaur King, which you guys put out. Uh, yes. Ray, and uh, he's like, this is the mine. this is the dumbest shit I've ever seen. <laughs> which is awesome. But hey, hey. let's uh, yeah. let's let's kind of go into the last topic. You're a busy guy. Yeah. How yeah. do you find time to work out? Um, I just I make it a priority. Yep. It's as simple as that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not just a, so, all right. So my fitness journey is, it was a weird one. Cause I was, uh, I love food. Me okay? too. I love food sexually almost. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it, like, like you put me at an all you can eat sushi place. It is, it, it's a horror show in there. Like it is not, yep. you know, I'm the same way. Censorship mosaic. It, it's just, <laughs> shame um and so i i was always a big eater but i was pretty skinny as a kid um you son of a bitch and, uh, as a kid okay, as a kid. okay and then um and then in my mid-20s it started to catch up with me uh and i felt it too like for my my uh, 28th birthday i had a goodbye party to my metabolism so <laughs> i well, I trained for a week according to the regimen of Nathan's hot dog eating champion Takeru Kobayashi. Oh wow! Um, and I, there was in New York. I was living in New York at the time, and and uh, there was this buffet that's still there. Um, it's called uh, Ichiyomi now, but back then it was called Todai, and it's a sushi buffet that's an entire city block long. What the fuck? Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's still so there. I invited all my, yeah. Uh, I haven't been in years. I have no idea if it's still the same, but um, so I invited all my friends and I bought a postage scale and weighed each plate before and after. And I managed that night. I managed four pounds, three ounces of sushi. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and then I moved here and you know, then you drive everywhere. You're not walking like you are in New York and it just, just I got big and I got really unhealthy. Are you, uh, a, and, you know, are you a, are you a tall guy? I'm six zero, so yeah. So you're a lot taller than me. So at least that weight yeah. looked somewhat, probably somewhat, you know, spaced out. Um, well, I wasn't like super heavy. I was I was two twenty, but it was all fat. Uh, like I was, you couldn't pay me to exercise in school. And believe me, my parents tried. Uh, like I was like I hated feeling dirty. I was bad at everything, and the kids that were good at it were assholes. So why yeah. would I want to spend time doing that? Yep. Um, and so like, and I I hated sports, like I couldn't, uh, I mean, I was in the audience. My dad bought us tickets for one of the, got us tickets somehow for one of the Pistons playoff games in the early nineties when they were winning everything. Uh, and I was just like, (laughs) can we go now? How Um, old were you? 10. 10. Eh, I, I, I would be pretty bored. Even now, if someone yeah. was like, someone offered me and my wife to go, like they would buy us Cubs tickets, and I was like, "Nah, that sounds awful." Can I bring my Switch? So, <laughs> there we go. So I was, um, you know, I was the anti-sport, and you know, I, 
wore that proudly and in in, uh, in college I picked up smoking because art school and <laughs> uh, uh, oh then art school and then working for for Korean so yeah uh, and so I was um, I was really unhealthy and my parents were like well he's gonna die in his mid fifties. Uh, in that tone of voice too. Oh, that's a, that's a that's a <laughs> very pretty... break like a heartbreaking thing to hear your parents say. Probably, I don't think they said that to my face until afterwards. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I I was on a business trip somewhere. I don't remember where, and there was this very mercilessly designed bathroom where you got out of the shower and you immediately saw yourself in the mirror getting out of the shower. Mm-mm. And I caught a glimpse of that, and I just wanted to dry heave. I was just like, what the? No. No. This has got to stop. So I got home, and I Googled closest gym to me, and it was this cro- CrossFit gym, and I never heard of CrossFit before. So I Googled that, and I'm like, that looks like the nuclear option. Okay. <laughs> so I went in. I took a session. I was, I was so weak, I couldn't do two push-ups in succession. Wow. Um, I was in bed and it wasn't super heavy. I was like, you know, but it was all fat. There was not a shred of muscle on me. And, uh, I started, I bought a juicer and I started, you know, replacing some meals with juice and I don't recommend this, uh, but which way. is exactly what uh, I did too. Yeah. It's and, awful. Uh, yeah. And I, you, you, like much like yourself, I lost way too much weight, way too quickly. Did you get that loose skin it, too? No, thank God. I wasn't, I wasn't that big and thank God I have really oily skin. So it, it wasn't a huge deal. Like I have stretch marks, but it's not loose. Um, and it was, I, I went through a whole identity crisis. Did, did you go through the thing where you look in the mirror and you don't recognize yourself yep. and you're just weirded out for the next half hour? Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, I lost, I lost, I was 340 at my heaviest and I'm five six five seven so wow that that's a big guy that's a big guy yeah i i was a big big dude i was the stereotypical italian chef i was i was loud yeah uh but also like i like our food's relatively healthy for what you can make italian food healthy because it's i mean really pizza and everything is just like the carbs are there yes but most of it is like i was eating mcdonald's and then eating a you know a five inch personal pizza extra thin, so I, it looked like I was eating somewhat good, and I was in football in high school, so I you know not because I wanted to, my parents were like you need to do an activity, um, and I was like all right I'll do football because I was big, and I could you know shove people good you know just like right. throw them around, so I was like I'll 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 I guess I'll do that, and then uh, I stayed relatively active because at the restaurant we make you know our doughs mixed by hand we don't have any machines like everything is yeah so i have i, I had muscle underneath the fat uh you're on your feet all day too that yeah I'm, I'm on my feet all day uh which recently i fell down my stairs and my back's been kinked up Oof. so i've been working with a probably a really messed up back but um so i used fope as a i, I mean i used food as a coping mechanism um for a lot of like internal, you know, like depression. Uh, and then like, when you get so big, you feel like there's no turning back. You're like, this is just my oh, yeah. life. Uh, Cause the getting big takes a lot of work, but losing the weight takes work too. But in your mind, it's harder than just sitting around getting fat. You give up on yourself. Yeah. It's a thing. Um, and when you give up on yourself on that level, subconsciously you give up on yourself on every level. Yep. Uh, at least for, for me anyway. I mean, I, um, I didn't trim my beard at all. I never got haircuts. I was just this, I, I almost had to get beard nets cause my parents were like, you cannot be around the food. You have to you know, wear something. So I didn't like, I didn't take care of my appearance. I let my unibrow grow. Uh, I was just, I, I looked like a slob. I, I was honestly a slob and I was also in a relationship, uh, for 10 years. That was very, un, that was very, un, it was very unhealthy. We were not good for each other. Um, and luckily, you know, I, I lost the weight, got out of that, and then met my wife who yeah. tries to stay active. But um, the there's a lot of like, the, the, sorry to cut you off there, there, there's a lot of really interesting changes that happen up here when you lose that weight, yeah. isn't there? Uh, like you get like, confident. Um, uh, you start to value yourself, and then suddenly everyone else starts to value you too. And then suddenly, like, 
I I ended up having money. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like, that's the other thing. I was like, I wasn't spending. I think I spent like probably a hundred bucks a week on a, a, every Monday, which is our day off work. I I would go and I would drop a hundred bucks on sushi, at least. And that was like that was my big thing. And I still continue to do that when I lost the weight. I had one cheat day, which was, was I would cheat yeah. on sushi. Which I would eat the actual raw sushi and not like you know the fry with the mayonnaise on it. So I was eating my my cheat day was relatively healthy, um, but yeah. I I have gained about fifteen twenty pounds because of the baby, uh, which is it happens it happens and, you know <laughs> especially because my wife would be like it's four in the morning and she wake me up and she go flipo um, I'm craving McNuggets and I'm like let's go get McNuggets. Well, also, you know, bad sleep that that doesn't help. Yeah, I, I my sleep schedule is mess because I uh, I'm 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 pretty caffeinated. I used to drink Mountain Dews all day, but now I switched to Monster Rehab, which is only twenty calories a can and three grams of sugar. So, uh, it's better than a Mountain Dew. But I drink three of these a day, sometimes more. I need to stop. That's like my one addiction. So when I get yeah. home, I can't just go to bed because I have to like shower. I smell like a pizza place. I gotta like unwind and relax. So. I, I have I have two recommendations for okay. you. The yes, first, please. the more expensive option is Fit Aid. What what's that? Uh, Fit Aid. It's um, it's a recovery drink. I had one this morning, but it has a, it has some caffeine in it. Okay. Um, and it tastes amazing. Like it's one of my favorite drinks. Uh, also, there is a um a soft drink called Zevia, which is stevia soda. Yep. So it's you know it's a lot healthier for you than the normal artificial sweeteners. Um, I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm drinking right now. I'm pretty and they sure do we have had, ones with I'm caffeine pretty, and ones without. I'm pretty sure we had that at the restaurant for a, a little bit. We, I think our yeah, pop guy I, gave us some. I mean, a lot of people don't like it because of the aftertaste, but you get past that after like two or three days. Um, and then it's like soda that won't give you cancer, which is <laughs> and, awesome, or make you fat. So, um, those those are the two things that I I still live by, and I feel absolutely no guilt about them. Um, these, uh, the fit aid can get expensive, but ZV is not too, you know, not too pricey. Um, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, that was, that was eight years ago that I caught the fitness bug and I've slowly been getting a little healthier and a little smarter about it ever since. And, uh, I, uh, last year I became a, a CrossFit coach as well. Just trying, to, awesome. trying to pay it Congratulations. forward. Congratulations. And you got a and, podcast uh, about it. Yeah, it's called Pile of Fit. Uh, for now, we're in the middle of retooling it. Um, we're uh, it, it's just me and my my uh, gym buddies, uh, the owner of my gym, and and uh, one of my other coaches. And uh, but we're trying to steer it away from uh, from CrossFit specifically because there's a bunch of frankly meat heady CrossFit podcasts out there, and yes. I just like I don't none of us care that much See, about talking about lifts. And that's the thing I love about hearing you talk about CrossFit is because you, I kind of, re, I kind of relate to you a lot more because uh, I've never was well, a me head and the no. me heads I have come across luckily have been really nice. Like, like, so like, I mean, to go on a tangent is when I went to the gym, like the yeah. thing that made me lose weight was I woke up one day, I was 21. I could not breathe. I had so much fat around my neck. Uh, I was like, oh my I, God. I was like, I can't, I need to do something. So oh, I, did, you, did you sleep after you? Uh, I never got diet. I never got diet. I never got diagnosed with it, but my, my, like when I lived with my parents, my snoring would wake them up, you know? So yeah, I, you I probably, probably, at least. I probably <laughs> did. But so I, I was like, I need to go, I, I need to lose weight. And I was like, I need to go all in or nothing. So I found this, uh, it's called lean meals. I don't know if they still do it, but, uh, lean meals, uh, they sent you all your food. You told, you tell them exactly what you wanted. I said, I want to have extremely low carbs. I still want to have some carbs, uh, no sugars. Uh, and I want to have all lean me. I want to build muscle while losing fat. So it was like 220 bucks a week, um, that I did. Yeah. Those, which, I, there are similar services around here, but there are honestly, which is not that bad that... considering you're getting breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks for every day for a yeah. week. So I, yeah. I, I did that religiously for nine months. Um, and I lost 130 pounds in nine months and it was the best decision I, I've ever made. Like I felt like the fact that I feel better, like I feel, I don't wake up and I don't have those weird pains, like those fat pains, you know, like you wake up and you're like, I'm out of breath just from getting into the shower. Uh, but that's the thing. When I first went to the gym before the diet, I tried to, I could not do two minutes on the treadmill. I was just, I was windy, yeah. just walking. Uh, 
and then it takes I, time. It takes a lot of time. And then and then I got hooked on powerlifting because I was big, uh, and I was right. working at the restaurant. So I started just powerlifting, and I got really into powerlifting, which just made me more massive. I just had more mass on top of this fat. Like I benched four fifty five at my peak for one, and I felt great. Wow. But then, but I couldn't go walk on the treadmill for two minutes. Like so, it was a very unhealthy yeah. thing. I was like, and then also you have to fight your ego too. It's like I want to be strong, and I want to be a strong guy, but. I don't want to like lose my muscle because I work so hard at it. But yeah, I I had to. It completely changed my personality. I had to let go of my ego uh, that I had built up from being strong, even though I was fat and I was still like I still hated myself. Uh, that was like something I like aligned myself with. I was like I'm the strong fat guy. I mean, like even on like Instagram, right. I would I I would put hashtag fat guy strong or something. You know, like something like stupid like that. And then eventually I lost the weight and. I would much rather be where I'm at now than be strong and heavy again. Cause I feel amazing. I can, I'm glad I can like chase my daughter around and, you know, play with her. Cause if yeah. I had a kid when I was fat, I would be miserable. I wouldn't be able to do anything. Oh yeah. I mean, there, there's some, I mean, nobody's going to argue that it's a better life being, being large. Um, I was, there was this great movie that just came out. Uh, Brittany runs a marathon. I've never seen that. Is um, that on Netflix? It no, it just came out in theaters. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, it, it's a it's a comedy and it's about a, a heavy girl who kind of hides behind a layer of cynicism and, sh and snark um and uh she has a moment with her doctor where she's like on the verge of becoming morbidly obese so she decides to take up running uh and uh this movie is that whole fitness journey from you know including the relapses including the self-loathing and all of that stuff and it's a comedy, but I was that weirdo sitting by himself, sobbing his eyes out at a comedy. Because <laughs> I'm just like, I feel every moment of this. Every moment. Like, I didn't get to go through exactly the same thing, but so close. It, like, I feel seen here. Um, I could awesome. have made this movie. Um, but, uh... I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna have to watch that. I, we don't have any, like, is that like yeah. a, is that like an indie film? Uh, it's indie-ish, but uh, I think it went wide release last weekend, so it might be near you. Because we don't uh, um, like, like I'm pretty surprised that we're getting pro mayor. Yeah, you just tomorrow. have the big AMCs and such. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's wider than pro mayor. I can guarantee you, it's wider than oh, pro well, mayor. Maybe, so you, you uh, might be playing maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, have to take my wife. You know, and my and my wife's going through that thing where. Uh, you know, she she just had a baby, so she in her mind thinks she's. Not. Oh yeah. And I'm like, you're perfect the way you are. So it's, it's it's so tough for women who just had had a baby, and I'll, like one thing we we see at the gym is like, they actually have a thing where they have trouble um, uh, controlling their uh, their lady parts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they'll they'll actually they'll actually have accidents while working out. Yep. Women have um, it rough, man. We just like they have it so rough. We just we just do the two and a half minute job. We're happy. Uh, my wife had morning sickness every day for nine months, like throwing up every day. It was a miserable pregnancy. Uh, the she she gave birth in thirty minutes, which was pretty quick. Uh, but afterwards, there was complications, and luckily she's good. I can actually hear my daughter. She's outside the door. Yeah, I, I hear. Her. I can, <laughs> she's. Uh, she is just a handful. I feel bad taking more of your time. Oh, no, no. Uh, usually she's supposed to be for a nap, so I think my wife is running her down because this is her nap time oh, okay. right now. We, we, uh, we gotcha, have her on gotcha. a very strict schedule. She naps about this time, and she goes fully to bed about – she's in bed about 10. We give her a bath. We do our you know, her nighttime ritual where she plays with her stuffed animal. The music's playing. She loves Mumford & Sons for some reason. That's just my, yeah. my daughter's favorite band. But uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Awesome. Uh, this has okay. been this has been an absolute pleasure, man. This is like seriously uh, uh, when you agreed to do this, uh, I was like, oh, shit. I'm going to have to do some more research because I I mean I knew you – I didn't do enough obviously. I'm a little embarrassed. I didn't know you founded Anime News Network. But uh, – Hey, you know what? It's a, it's a long and weird career. Who could blame me for missing something? <laughs> but uh, honestly, you are one of the nicest people I've talked to. Uh, you're one of the you're one of my favorite people on Twitter because you'll just drop like little knowledge about anime here and there. You're also really funny. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, you are a very genuine person, and I am very happy for everything that you guys are doing at Discotech. And I'm super excited to see what comes next. So if you want to close out, uh, tell people where they can follow you and find you at. Uh, well, on uh, Twitter, I'm at World of Crap. Which why did um, you pick that name? Because uh, I I've um, you know. I have a dark sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> and after, after a while, I, 
I just, you know, I used to be a much darker person <laughs> and I've had, I've had that, I've had that handle for over a decade. So that's a pretty good handle. Too. Um, you know, I, it, it's OG. I'm worried someone's going to poach it for me. <laughs> uh, let's see. So, um, world of crap. Uh, and then, uh, I do, you know, you can follow my work with, uh, discotech media. They're on Facebook, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. Um, Aside from that, uh, you can read my old columns on Anime News Network, um, Answer Man, and Buried Treasure, and uh, Pile of Shame, and uh, my very, very short-lived uh, Tales from the Industry. Wish I would, <laughs> wish I could have kept that one going longer, but that just couldn't. That was too hard. Uh, uh, just, a, just a side tangent: uh, when I'm in a Facebook group, it's about 400 people. When I said, "Hey, I, 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 I got an interview with you." Uh, someone was like, isn't that the Answer Man guy from Anime News Network? Like, that's the only place that they knew you from. And I was like, yeah, but he also does a lot of discotech stuff, too. And they were like, holy crap. So, I mean, people you know, know you just from I've, all different things. I've been doing this so long. Uh, one of our, uh, one of our like, junior assistants was helping Brady with something. I think it was, uh, what is the episode of Movie 2, Beautiful Dreamer? Um, and they were transcribing some, some old credits from an old release and my name came up on those credits. Wow. And, and they just went, wow, Justin's been doing this a long time, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> and Brady, Brady told me that I'm like, yes, yes, he has. Well, thank you so much, man. So, this has been, this has been a real pl- Like this is seriously probably my favorite thing I've done on YouTube yet. Oh, this well, is, thank you so much. That means, the, that means the, a lot to me. I had a great time. Uh, you know, it, I'd love to do this again anytime. Awesome, man. Thank you. And I will, and I will take you up on that. I'm going to probably around when giant, <laughs> probably like when like giant robo comes out, I'll, I'll watch it and then talk to you about it. And if, and if you're ever in LA, uh, I'll take you through a CrossFit workout and we will work out to Euro beat. Dude, wait, what kind of Euro beat? <laughs> what, what kind of Euro beat are we talking about? Well, you know what kind of Eurobeat we're okay, talking about. Okay, well, like, like what's, what's your favorite Eurobeat song? Oh, well, are we talking ironic or are we talking genuine? I think I think those two can intermingle perfectly well. Okay, genuine. Um, you know what? Okay, both. It's actually not used in Initial D. However, it does have an anime connection. There is a song from one of the Super Eurobeat albums that Avix used to put out um called uh dreaming of you by and the the band it was under was lolita it's all the same five people using a bunch of pseudonyms <laughs> um and uh so the song dreaming of you by lolita i listened to it and i'm just like this sounds really familiar and then i realized it's the fucking second one piece opening they redid it in japanese <laughs> wow like, that's awesome yes. So, and uh, I actually, I was at a, a Japanese karaoke place and they had it in English, the, the uh, Lolita version. Did you just so bust I, out in song? Yes, <laughs> with other people in the room. And it's like, holy shit, trying to sing Super Eurobeat is fucking impossible. You are out of breath. You're just like, because there, there is no breath. It's a million miles an hour. Well, now, it's if so- I ever come to LA, we have to do a... CrossFit workout, and we have to go do karaoke and only do Eurobeat songs. Anytime, man. Uh, let, let me know. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for watching, and uh, I'll catch you guys next time.